Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek. That's, that is I. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and Dr. Who, Mark. <laughs> okay, who am I? I'm, I'm, I'm over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. ready. <laughs> and that episode that, number 40, uh, 42, right? Dun, 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 dun. Here's the story. And that guy down there is Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. <laughs> I just remind me of the Brady Bunch. Like, he's down there. <laughs> Okay, forget. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining joining us today, Dr. Holacek. You're, you're welcome. I never watched the Brady Bunch. I was too immersed in my three sons. You know, shows you how. Oh, oh it's such a good. Well, if you can, if you can find it on uh, on on um, one of the. Shows. My younger brother watched it. That was a good reason not to watch it. <laughs> I hope he's not watching this. <laughs> When he was watching <laughs> Scooby Doo and uh, Speed Racer and stuff like that, but oh, I can't say I was much better with my taste in television stuff. But uh, so, anyways, neither the here nor there. <laughs> All right, what are we doing today? We doing something? You just gave me another idea. Now oh, we need God, we need God. a we need a um uh, a founding father Saturday morning cartoon. Well, you can think that up. Yeah. I don't know that. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Dr. Holacek would be the person to consult with if you want accuracy with Thomas Jefferson. He is the best. Um, he knows um, Thomas Jefferson most intimately. I, I believe um, that you you know him, all aspects of him, not just his political view. You you're, you know him as a mathematician, as as an expert in so many things. Um, so today, Dr. Holacek is going to answer questions from query six on notes of the on uh, notes on the state of Virginia. And it is um, Thomas Jefferson's view on native Virginians, um, the Indians. Uh, first though, you know what comes first? <laughs> we have, we must do credentials. Um, Dr. Holacek is a professor of philosophy and history, the best combination there is. And um, you have actually inspired me, I do need to add that, to learn more about Greek philosophers because of the influence they had on our founding fathers, on specifically Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Um, and because we can't know what was intended in the writing of our Declaration and Constitution, our important founding documents, if we don't understand who inspired the writers of those documents. So, that, and that's why um, your combination of philosophy and history is, is perfect for what you do um, and educating us, those of us who are listening to the show today. Um, and Dr. Holacek has taught at institutions such as University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, Rutgers University, Camden, and Ohio University. He's the editor of the Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time, and he has been the author and editor. He is the author editor over 23 published books on Thomas Jefferson and close to 200 essays um, on Thomas Jefferson. And the list will be in the description in the video. Um, with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. Um, and I think, wow, we're in the 40s already with our episodes. <laughs> yeah, wow. 42. Wow, this is great. Um, and if any of you have questions, have suggestions for topics you'd like for us to discuss, please feel free to put that in the comments. Please like and subscribe. Um, so you'll get notif you'll be notified when we uh, post a, a new topic, a new video. Um, but, and also if you're interested in making a guest appearance to ask Dr. Holacek questions, please feel free to contact me, um, write a message in um, a comment on uh, the YouTube video. Uh, we, we welcome that. I'd, I'd like to <laughs> um, open, open it up. Maybe we can have a contest or something and open it up to, to people who would like to ask a write in a question or, or if they don't want to appear live uh, on our show, they can send us questions too. So um, I really would like to make this as interactive for the general public as possible. Um, Dr. Holacek, we're, we're very fortunate to have his time and attention today. Um, okay, so let's get started. Are you ready? 
for our so. introduction. Okay, so last week we looked critically at the third part of query six titled Productions, Minerals, Vegetables, and Animal of Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. We then looked at non-human animals native to Virginia. We look today at human animals native to Virginia, Virginian Native Americans and transplanted Europeans. Oh, wow, this is this is exciting. And I know we have done, um, if you look back um, for our audience, if you look back, we have done an episode similar to this um, uh, where Thomas Jefferson talks about Native Americans. I, um, I forget the date of it though, uh, but we have done a talk. So this is a companion piece. We're not, it's not going to be redundant in the least. Right. Oh, no, we're not at all. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you were doing um, research, you may want to refer back to the other video as well, if this is the topic that, that you need. Okay. Question number one. Jefferson aims to examine both Native Americans and transplanted Virginians. He begins with a qualification concerning the scope of his inquiry. Can you explain that to us? Qualification. Yeah. Um, being a good empiricist, and this is where Jefferson is at his best. He, uh, he qualifies what he is about to say by the scope of his own experiences. And he says, uh, you know, he doesn't want to talk about the Aborigines of South America. He says, the, of the Indian of South America, I know nothing, for I would not honor with the appellation of knowledge what I derive from the fables published of them. So he's talking about, well, there are many stories I've heard about the natives of the Aborigines of South America, but these are all from fabulists. <laughs> None of them seem to be reliable. They may be as true as the fables of, of Aesop. Okay, um, this belief is found in what I've seen of man, white, red, and black, in what has been written of him by authors enlightened themselves in writing amidst an enlightened people. So he wants to restrict his comments to the, the natives of North America. He says, these are more within my reach. Um, I can speak of him somewhat from my own knowledge, but from the information of others better acquainted with him on who truth and judgment I can rely. Now, um, the idea here is he has, and he has plentiful experiences. I mean, Native uh, Indian chiefs used to stop at his father's house, at his home when he was a boy, and he would, you know, watch his father interact with uh, some of the some of the Aborigines. Uh, but he says, well, I don't even trust that. I know some people who have studied the issue of Native, of Native Americans and uh, whose judgment I trust. So it's not just people. They need to be trustworthy people. So that's his qualification. I'm just going to do Native Americans. And I'm admitting my testimony is a little bit from my own experience, but mostly from people who have a more professional opinion whose judgment I trust. Okay. Question number two. He begins with Buffon. Uh, Buffon's claim that the savage of the new world is smaller, though not in height. What does he mean? What is Buffon's argument? Yeah, Comte de, Comte de Buffon, with whom, uh, to whom we were introduced last time, it has a right. whole litany of comments on American Aborigines. And his comments are, again, related to Aborigines of North and South America. And I'm not going to go through the whole list, but he says that uh, the savage is feeble and has smaller organs of generation. How he knows that smaller testicles and whatever penis, I guess. Uh, he has neither hair nor beard nor ardor for his female. He's faster than the European, but not naturally fast. It's just because he's used to running and things like that. Uh, he is less sensitive, more timid and cowardly. Uh, I don't know what experience he has, no vivacity or activity of mind, so he's not as intelligent. Mm -hmm. The activity of his body is less an exercise, a voluntary, exercise, uh, voluntary motion than a necessary action. Um, if, you, if he's hungry or thirsty, you're not going to get any activity out of it. Um, they lack ardor for their females. He says that already. Um, so he's cold and languid uh, when he's not engaged in anything that he needs to do. There's no intimacy. In other words, the sort of uh, the Catholic affection that, that uh, some 
people have, or, or the Christian effects that some people have for the family, the value of the family. Uh, you don't expect to find them among Native Americans. Their heart is icy, their society cold, their rule harsh, their wives are servants for work. They have fewer children than white people. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, he is worse off than his white counterpart, than just about every score. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Jefferson is going to later ask, upon what are you basing this? <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting. And, and that's why he gives, in answer to the first query or question, that's why he gives his source. Jefferson says, well, I have interactions. And he had numerous interactions with Davis. He really did. Right. Uh, as well as he's drawing from testimonies of reliable people. He's later going to say, where did Buffon get his information? Well, that's a question that goes to question number three. Um, how does Jefferson counter Buffon's claims? Well, he... He has his own litany of, of uh, information. Um, he says he's just as amorous with his females than whites are. He's not as more impotent. He's as potent as whites are. He's, and this is what Jefferson, when, when he said, uh, when Buffon said he's cowardly. <laughs> and, you know, Jefferson, no, he's brave. Uh -huh. uh, when an enterprise depends on bravery, he will defend himself against a host of enemies. I mean, from everything most people know about Native Americans, why Buffon would think that uh, they are cowardly. He is affectionate with children. Uh, his friendships are strong and faithful. Mm -hmm. His sensibility, he has keen sensibility. His vivacity and activity of mind is equal to ours, right? So he, um, um, and in the, case of um, women, you know, they expose their women to drudgery, but it's sort of like the Native American males are like Spartans of their of Spartan times. So the Spartans would engage in warfare, and the chief activity of the female was to, to bear viable children. Uh -huh. And so, the you know, of course, the women are submitted to drudgery, but we saw that back, back in Russia and Ukraine, you know, women would work the fields while the Cossack men were out in raids and so forth. And well, that's uh, yeah. Well, well that's um, question. Um, the the next question. Um, oh, I have them. Um, I have them um, misnumbered here. So I think we're going to have six questions. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson. So we're getting to that. Thomas Jefferson states that Native American women are subject to unjust drudgery. Well, <laughs> yeah, um, as is the case with all barbarous people, barbarous people. Why is that the case? Well, Jefferson has very Victorian, and I say this, you know, out of place. He's, you know, not living in Victoria, but he has sort of Victorian ideas of uh, very conservative views of what a woman's role is. And a woman's role is domestic. She's supposed to be, you know, in a large mansion like Jefferson a fairly large mansion. She's supposed to be the domestic um, manager of of the plantation house, uh -huh. right? And her role should be domestic, and she shouldn't be subject. Jefferson thought women were, and of course this is true to experience, not as robust or physically strong as men, and that's clearly true, but doesn't mean that they can't go out and do agricultural work, and a lot of Right. societies women were doing arduous work like I, I mentioned russia and ukraine and you know uh, in the time of the cossacks and so forth and my grandmother for example uh, she came from ukraine and she was used to working really hard it's funny one time when she was remember she was 86 and i was back in detroit and i was in my 40s this was decades and decades and decades ago i was painting her barn and she yells at me it's it's uh she was 86 years old and it's in the low 90s and of course i'm sweating and you know getting a lot of sun and she says to me Monica, you're going to have a heart attack and while she's saying this she's in the garden upturning the soil right where she can uh reading the garden it was uncharacteristically hot in in, in late spring at the time so she was used to doing the arduous work uh at the time too so 
I mean, but you know, the, so go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I can see that he, um, the Native American women, he, I guess he saw that they had to do a lot of stuff outside the home, um, as well as yeah. traditional duties. And, and he just didn't think, you know, he said the same, you know, a French woman, he thought they were involved in politics. They were out in, involved in social affairs, discussing politics. And he, he thought that that was uh, uh, either OTOs or just awkward or strange for, for women to be engaged. You know, the, the woman's role, let's put it, you know, in the state today in a chauvinistic way, women's role was in the house. Right. Right. And, you know, Jefferson believed, that's what a lot of people believed at the time, that, that especially in early America, that the woman's role was a domestic role. She belonged in the house managing the affairs. That doesn't mean that's not necessarily chauvinistic, right. because a woman in an early American household like the one Jefferson had would have an important role. And it's not like the man would come stomping in from the fields and say, you know, woman of the house, do this. No, she would say, keep quiet. I'm in charge of this. This is my household. I'll see to it that everything's directed. Right. So it, the the woman directed the affairs in the house, and the man outside of the house. Each had was the equal of the other in many respects in terms of their own dominion. Right. And and it seemed to me in reading Query Six that um, he had a very he he thought that the. Um, the Indian women were actually pretty slick and um, they knew how to take care of, of uh, and manage how many children they had, <laughs> um, ha how to keep themselves from having more than what they wanted. Um, well, they had to. They naturally. Had a method. He talks about a method of abortion because they would accompany at times their men on, you know, in war campaigns. And you know, you can't really do that that easily if you're pregnant or something. And right. so you had to manage the household. And to the objection of Buffon that they're less fecund, less fertile than the white women. No, they weren't. He argues, well, look at instances where white settles take an, uh, an Aboriginal as a wife. They have just as many children. So he's appealing to certain experiences here that to which Buffon doesn't appeal. Uh, again, you have to look at all the data. And so he really, again, you know, puts bullet holes in what what Buffon has to say about the Native American women, Indian women. Yeah, they were actually very smart, very clever. And and um, and, and I, I have a different outlook on Native American women as well from doing my master's paper and how the, how the Native American um, women helped the... Um, different minority women in the 1800s, um, later on in the 1800s, how they helped them uh, settle in the West. In when the, West. the men the men were busy fighting each other, the women were, were getting along and helping one another. So um, that's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting the, the, um, to study. The, uh, okay, the next question. Um, what of the genius and morality of Native Americans? Um, here, can you say something about Mingo mm -hmm. Chief Logan? Okay, genius by genius. Jefferson commonly used the term, and it was commonly used. That doesn't mean what we mean by genius, just meant intelligence, the level of the right. intelligence. But it's a commonly used term by Jefferson, meaning nothing more than the intelligence. So a level, when he says it's a level of their genius, it's a level of their intelligence. Uh, he, uh, he finds it strange, for example, to talk about, just go back to the, let me go off the side of the physicality. Buffon admits that they're physically defective in almost every way, but they're the same type. And Jefferson argues, well, how is it that nature allows Native Americans to grow to the same height, but yet in every other aspect they're physically defective? Right. Maybe there's something wrong with the reasoning, right? Um, okay. See where he talks about. Uh, okay, you know, and he said, uh, in some regards, they're physically as, in some sense, as robust or at least as tall as, but he says, in what sense has nature acted against the direction of his mind alone? He writes, to judge the truth of this, to form a just estimate of their genius and mental powers. 
More facts are wanting and great allowance to be made for the circumstances of their situation, which call for a display of particular talents only. Um, so he's basically saying, well, you put them in a situation of small tribes where they're hunting and gathering and fighting, you're not really challenging them intellectually. Right. You're not challenging their genius. And um, he says, once we do that, put them, change the situation, in other words, misog misogynate with them, you know, um, have sex between whites and natives. He says, this done, we should probably find they are formed in mind as well as in body on the same module as the Homo sapiens europaeus, mm -hmm. as European, you know, Homo sapiens. Um, they do have a sense of morality. There is eloquence in counsel, bravery, address in war, right? Um, he will say in other places that they do not have laws because the societies are too small, they're not needed. Mm -hmm. So they use shame uh, to, to force them. They apply in the moral sense. So he doesn't think there's any reason to think that they're morally defective. That's the same concession he makes with respect to, to blacks is that mm -hmm. they're the moral equals, all people. And that just makes sense with his moral sense. And I, I have a video on that I put up this week. Jefferson thought all people were born with a moral sense. Like mm -hmm. all people are born with eyes. So to say that, you know, if you're a Native American, uh, an American Aborigine, that, you know, your eyes are somehow defective, right? Because, you you know, that seems untoward or unwarranted. Uh -huh. In the same way, there's no reason to think that there are moral differences. Now, you talked of um, the, the Mingo chief Logan, and there's a story there, and this talks about their intelligence as well as their bravery and Mingo was a chief very dear to Jefferson and there was a story that he covers um, he says in the spring of 1774 there was a robbery by some Mingo Indians on the on certain land adventures of the river Ohio okay so the the whites of the area took revenge upon the robbery and what happened is under Captain Michael uh, Cresap. And this whole story got Jefferson involved in all sorts of litigation, whether just to what extent what Jefferson is say is true. Um, they led a party of whites against the, uh, the family of Logan, right? There were a bunch of uh, women and children and so forth at, at the mouth of the Kanawha River. And what happens uh, with the collected, you know, and then they had a, they killed, the whites killed family members of Mingo. And so there was this great war. And the um, uh, Shawanese, the Mingos and the Delawares got together and they fought against the Virginia militia. Uh -huh. and the Native Americans were destroyed in the battle. So there's a Delegation for peace, and Mingo gives this long uh, speech. He was, he did not condescend to attend because he thought, okay, some people stole from you, so you massacre members of my family. This is not a fair exchange. It's not a fair act of revenge. Uh -huh. That's why the war, and I'll, I'll read this thing um, because it's sort of moving. I appeal to any white man to say, if ever he entered Logan's cabin hungry and he gave him not meat, if ever he came cold and naked and he clothed him not. During the course of the last long and bloody war, Logan, who's speaking of himself, remained idle in his cabin and advocate for peace. Such was my love for the whites that my countrymen pointed as they passed and said, Logan is the friend of white men. I had even thought to have lived with you, but for the injuries of one man, Colonel Cresap, uh -huh. the last spring in cold blood and unprovoked, murdered all the relationships, all the relations of Logan, not sparing even my women and children. There runs not a drop of my blood in the veins of any living creature. This called on me for revenge. I have fought it. I have killed many. I have fully glutted my vengeance. For my country, I rejoice at the beams of peace, do not, but do not harbor a thought that mine is the joy of fear. Logan never felt fear. He will not turn on his heel to save his life. Who is there to mourn for Logan? Not one. So the, the 
Mingo Chief is talking about the other thing he says here, if the story is accurate, is Logan appeals through this speech to to uh his he was unjustly his members of the family were murdered. What does he do to counter that? Right? Well, he goes to war mm -hmm. and they lose the war, but notice he says, My appetite for revenge is done. I'm done with that. He doesn't sit back like the Hatfields and McCoy, well, I'm going to get you back somehow. It's it's okay. Right. It's The event played itself out, right? But he lost. He's not fearful. I've killed many. I've blooded, says I've blooded my vengeance. Uh, but who is there to worry about him? And in some sense, he says, there's not a drop of my blood that's not of all people. So presumably that he's had sex with white females as well and has children with white women. Uh, that seems to be obvious right so um he includes that because he wants to show that logan gives a speech the equal of demosthenes the greek great in cicero the two or cicero the latin oratory that here among the natives here's an example of greatness of oratory so you have people with right. with eloquence among natives we have proof of it and that's why he's oh okay uh, yeah I think that was um yeah that's what I was looking um looking at when I was reading the letter the reference to Cicero um okay question number five finally we come to comments of Abbe Renal one must be astonished that America has not yet produced on good poet uh, I'm sorry one good poet one able mathematician one man of genius in a single art or a single science, how does Thomas Jefferson counter Raynal? Yeah, uh, Raynal was another was, uh, another Frenchman who wanted to say, okay, if you want to, you know, remember Buffon saying the continent is cold and wet, and this is a condition that's inhospitable for any kind of biotic thriving, any kind of living mm -hmm. organisms, plant or animal, and Abby Raynell has given the account, well, look, you know, proof of this is you want to talk about the field experience, show me a good poet. Uh -huh. Show me a good warrior, whatever he says, whatever the three talks about, what mathematician, man of intelligence, right? Um, and, you know, you know, so, I mean, he's, uh, you know, so Raynal was uh, an outspoken critic of the old world. He'd never been there as well. Uh, the Jefferson counter says, when we shall have existed as a people, as long as the Greeks did, before they produced a Homer, the Romans a Virgil, the French a Racine and Voltaire, the English a Shakespeare and Milton, should this approach still be true, we will inquire from what unfriendly causes. He says, in war, the colonists have has produced Washington. In physics and science, we have Benjamin Franklin, who's known to be one of the world's foremost scientists at the time. Uh -huh. In uh, astronomy, we have perhaps the greatest living astronomer, Mr. Rittenhouse. He's no second, and this is ridiculous, but he says he's no second in effect to Newton simply because he was self-taught. Uh -huh. uh, but Rittenhouse was a creator of astral and stuff, so he was... Uh, so he wants to say, uh, and then he talks about numbers. He's talking, okay, here's Jefferson always mathematizing, arithmetizing. Uh -huh. says, the United States has 3 million, 3 million people, France 20 millions, and the British Islands 10. We produce a Washington, a Franklin Rittenhouse. Okay, so he starts talking about projections, and he said, uh, give us time, and you're going to see genius flourish in the continent. We just, too little time. Yeah. Um, too few people. And, and that's basically his argument. Now, that said, uh, there's one, one other thing to add here I didn't talk about, where he challenged just before going to the Abbey Raynell. And, and remember, Abbey Raynell is not just talking about uh, aboriginals. He's talking about people transplanted, white people going to the continent. They're going to degenerate. Black people going to the continent will degenerate because the conditions are bad. And uh, so, you know, prior to that, so I, so that's the objection to right now, but when he talks about Buffon, um, and he's talking about Buffon's theory, 
And he says, I, and this is a cool line, he goes, I am induced to suspect that there has been more eloquence than sound reasoning. In other words, he's blab blabbing, like the mm -hmm. sometimes. He's blab blabbing without like really that. saying anything, <laughs> or I like to do whatever, without <laughs> saying anything of important. So there's more, um, he says, more, there's more eloquence than sound reasoning displayed in support of his theory. It is one of those cases where the judgment has been seduced by a glowing pen. And while I render every tribute of honor and esteem to the celebrated zoologist who has added and still adding so many precious things to the treasures of science, notice he's saying this is the great man, the great man. I must doubt whether in this instance he has not cherished error also by lending her for a moment his vivid imagination and bewitching language. So uh -huh. pretty strong attack of Buffon. You know, when he sees Buffon in France, uh, Buffon doesn't like that, I guess, but he's willing to take it. But I mean, so, you know, he has respect for Buffon, but he just thinks he, he got it yeah. wrong. You know, well, it's just, it's just the instance of getting it wrong. Thank Jefferson. goodness Thomas Jefferson was here to develop. Oh, there's the real Jefferson. Oh, there's the jumping Jefferson. up on the side the whole time. I know. I saw him walking in and out of the room. Um, well, I'm glad that Thomas Jefferson could come to the to the defense of the Indians. Um, I, I really, I really like um, what what he's done here. Um, what a well, you know what? It, it's not, you know, it's not a pre-planned defense right it's just from his own experiences and from the testimonies of other people he sees no reason to think that Buffon got it right you know yeah. one thing when we're looking at Jefferson he, he, and, and I, people will will say this is wrong other scholars I think the scholars are Jefferson doesn't have these biases he might come to the table thinking from my own experiences that the Native Americans are equal of whites but then he still does the science like remember he said with African Americans because they've never been the objects of scientific investigation. So even if I think that they're wanting in intelligence and imagination, uh -huh. right, and in beauty, wait till the scientists thoroughly study this and then we can form our people. People right. always admit that. They always admit that. Omit it because, or if they include it, they say, well, he's being wishy-washy. Can't make up his mind. That's science. Oh, that's, that's right, right, right. You have to say, we, you know, even when we talk about smoking causes cancer, right? There's still right. this tiny element of doubt. That's just the nature of the scientific method. It doesn't get, it's not mathematical certitude. Mm. Okay, so that's, oh. that's. And we can find, um, we can find this writing in your book, Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. Of no, Pro I don't, Pro I don't have that in my book. It's okay. not in no, the book we have in Notes on Virginia. No, right. I don't have the, uh, because it's a prolegomena. Okay. Which okay. means it, it. I started doing that. That's a good question. Thanks for asking that. I wanted to do a version of his notes on Virginia, like I did his Bible, and then have a commentary. But okay. the commentary got too big. Right? And it's just like I realized there was so much. The mistakes other scholars make when approaching Jefferson notes by not having read Bacon, by not having read Newton's Principia or his optics, uh, by not studying uh, the scientific climate at the time, not knowing what's scala natura, how many people, uh, the scale of nature, write of this book and don't even know what the scale of nature is. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of scholars who write of this. Of course, they always look at query 14, just look at race, as if that's the way to understand the book, look at a small section of one of the... the but the point is, you have to know so much just to be able to start reading the book. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that background knowledge, you're going to make mistakes. Like the two sc scholars, uh, Klingard and I don't see the fellow's name, they, they wrote a uh, book on, and I thought it, it was just pretty laden with mistakes all over the place mm -hmm. because they read into the book without having the background knowledge to understand it. They scoured the literature on it. They did a wonderful job of, of citing literature, but my guess is they just didn't understand um, what was going on. You know, they wanted to they wanted to read it in terms of Jefferson appropriated from the Bible, which he did wasn't uh -huh. doing. He's just doing a scientific right. investigation, right? So, so that's that. Okay. 
Um, well, let, let's get to the next episode. Um, can you give us a teaser? What we can expect? Well, for you, next you picked this out. This was a letter yeah. uh, from Jefferson to James Madison while Jefferson was still in France early in 1787. And uh, it's an interesting letter for me because uh, it talks about Jefferson's views of republicanism. If you followed Aristotle and you follow Montesquieu, who wrote uh, in Jefferson's day, democracy could not exist in other than a very small society. Because if you're talking about all people being participants in the government, it's got to be restricted to a small parcel of land where all can have access to participation and you know in those right. affairs. And Jefferson is going to here, you know, examine that view to some extent and then talk about three different sorts of societies. The society like the Native Americans, and this piggybacks on that, who have no laws. You have other societies that have too many laws. And right. whenever we find too many laws, he's always going to say this is what? A society uh, that's corrupt. Uh -huh. In a sense that that's true. When you keep having law after law after law after law, it's you're covering your butt from the injustice of another law. So there's another law. Right. There's all sorts of corruption going on. Right. And Jefferson says, you know, the government is best when governors are performing silently when you can't even know that they're there. Right. So government with no laws, government with too many laws, and then presumably government with just the right number of laws that are needed. And so we're going to look at those three forms of government and see. Um, now, the question I, I have for before we leave, do you think Jefferson, for, for the listeners, does, do you think Jefferson would prefer a society, a small society without any laws, right? There are problems with that, or a society where there are too many laws. So I leave, that's the teaser. I leave oh, okay. listeners with that. Clearly, he's going to side for the one where... They're just, you know, decent amount, of, no more laws than they're needed. Right, right. Mr. Liberty. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, thank and his, you. His, uh, don't forget to talk about his birthday coming up. Yes, yes. Next week, his... next week we're celebrating his birthday, right? Yes. Oh, yes. So we'll do our episode on his birthday. Yeah. Yeah. So next next Thursday we'll be recording the episode on April 13th. We'll, we'll say happy birthday to Thomas Jefferson. And um, and uh, so we'll do the episode on James Madison for his. That'll program. be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. Okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll look forward to seeing everybody next time. Yes, thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. And please like and share the video if you have questions um, and you'd like to be part of the show. Please make a comment and let us know. Okay. Bye. <laughs>